tremendous amount of civil society uh, mobilization. And in this, I would like to make one important point, and that is civil society, when one talks of, as I said in the beginning, we are also civil and are we uncivil, civil society tends to work <clears throat> within the framework of state, which is that civil society it does not work to or against the state framework. It is not there to destroy the state. As I said, it is a intermediary between individual and the state. Ali. Yeah. Are NGOs the problem to any issue or are there solutions to it? I'll come to it. Uh, we'll discuss the <coughs> NGOs. So, what I was trying to say is that the uh, NGOs or the, or, or, the, or the civil society work within a framework. And that is the reason why there is a lot of acceptance of the ideas that come up from the civil society. Finally, and I'll put a few things for discussion, and then we'll take up your, uh, your, your point also. Let us look at some of the issues. As I have already mentioned to you, there is no estimate of number. And when there is no estimate of number, there is no way to develop a typology of NGOs. The typology of NGOs, there are a large number of NGOs who work and support the government. That means there has been at a point of time when we were talking of informal education, a large number of NGOs were formed which provided for informal education. Even today, there are a large number of NGOs which provide for supporting the government in terms of the weaknesses, gaps that occurred in the failures of public policy. So whether, whether you talk of uh, Pratham or you talk of uh, several other uh, educational NGOs which support and develop capacity for improved primary education. I am only asking one smaller question and that is, supposing I say CSO as an organization says Pepsi has X amount of insecticides. It says it for one, say three years back and after that, that does no research to confirm or not confirm so that people forget it and then go back to Pepsi. So, so what are you doing? You're trying to poison the minds of the people whether you should go for a Coke or should not go for a Coke. And you not you first told them that there is a problem. You not found out the solution. You're not taking it further. You've left it halfway. So people are thoroughly confused. No, but uh, then what you're asking, asking for is the, the, that CSO should have become more active. I mean, that's what you're asking for. I mean, you're asking for yeah, that there ought to, to be there ought to be more and more CSOs who should be working and identifying this. I mean, that's what we are asking for. But I think that's a fair demand. I mean, if no, I'm not, I'm only suggesting you can't raise an issue and leave it midway. Fair enough. Fair. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. But you know, it becomes very kind of a uh, difficult problem even to mobilize resources. In Kerala, in Palakadam, where the issues of uh, groundwater were involved and where Coca-Cola factory at the panchayat took a very active protest, which was the state government then went against the panchayat in favor of Coca-Cola until the panchayat had to go to the court and had gone to the Supreme Court and that case is still lying with the Supreme Court. Now, here is persistence. Here is, here is this NGOs together with the panchayat being able to stop Coca-Cola production in Palakadam. So, I mean, 
some there are bigger lobbying powers as well. Uh -huh. and bigger communications agendas. So they're able to make ineffective other agencies that could be producing a better result, which is more, uh, is better for the common good. I think that's where some uh, organizations like NGOs, which are working in civil society, they tend to lose their power because they don't have the lobbying power or the communication skills to tackle something to a sustained uh, public effort. Sure. I agree with that. Because most of these campaigns that I was illustrating, all of these campaigns have used the courts for help in determining policy. Whether it's question of education, the right to education, they had to go to Supreme Court. What has been happening in India today is that through PIL and through this mobilization, if government is unresponsive, the NGOs and civil society organizations have used the courts very effectively and where the courts have interpreted right to life in a way in which whether it is clean air in Delhi or it is right to food or right to employment in a way that is far more liberal than one would have expected. Sir, I also have a question. In a highly stratified society like India, uh, what are the participatory ground rules for every voice to be heard, for every strata to have a voice in the democratic process? Meaning? Ground rules? Meaning mean? that um, in a very highly stratified society where caste domination and suppression is very common, and public policy through civil society action is made through participatory voices, Every community is not represented in common agendas in policy making. So how do we determine this and strengthen uh, participation at the ground level? No, but for for instance, are... I went to a village which was actually the panchayat is seated in another village. And this particular village is a majority of one community. But the panchayat has the decision-making powers over both the villages, and they are two different communities. So one is actually being overlooked. Yeah, yeah. How do we overcome see, these challenges? See, these are these. There are various kinds of issues for which the NGOs struggle. The outcome of every struggle does not lead to a policy. The outcome, unless there is much widespread mobilization and support, it today, for example, whether you talk of whatever actions are uh, in terms of uh, what panchayats do, uh, pass laws in Beacon Air against women, the, uh, the effort to see that this does not happen requires much greater support and mobilization of the people. But what the NGOs do is to build up on the various struggles that they make. So there is, there is these grassroots, community-based civil society organizations that continually try to bring awareness, mobilize people on these kinds of issues. So I mean, one is not merely talking of CSOs working at the national level. But there are these CSOs working at, at the grassroots level, which, have, which are doing this work. The right to information emerged out of work being done at the local panchayat level. And then the mobilization, it was possible for NGOs to pick up that mobilization, to make it to a statewide agitation before it became nationwide. So that, there are these kind, different kinds of levels. I'm taking you to the interpretation of facts yeah. that, uh, for example, if government of India says that international trade is very good for India, and the civil society says no, internal trade should be promoted inside India. So in this case, these are the two, uh, two interpretations do done by the government and civil society. So in this case, where, where, is, the, where is the inter intersection point that these two facts get intersected and goes to the policy. I mean, is there any uh, real life, how, how does it work in 
real life. I'm, I mean, government advocating for some, some agenda and civil society advocating for some agenda and how does these intersect and go for public policy? See, let us not uh, think of civil society organization coming in because it says something, it becomes a policy. As I said, that policy making is an arena of contestation, isn't it? You allow for contestation when other voices also come to speak. But that does not mean that the other alternate, other voices, alternative voices are necessarily ones that will determine policy. But you allow for different debates to take place in public domain. And when different debates and different ways of looking at things take place in public domain, then policies can be crafted in a different fashion. That's the only point. The point is not that every civil society organization goes in and determines the public policy, no. But their role is in terms of bringing what was not in public domain to bring it into public domain. That's a very important role. Once you have identified a problem from an issue, it has become a problem. The way the children are being treated in the country, in the, in the various uh, shelters and homes, uh, it is now being identified as a major problem of child welfare. Now, if that is, that is the role that they perform, and it is possible through mobilization, through greater support, to be able to change policy. That's the issue. So it is not as if that just because a civil society organization is saying that we are anti-international trade and suddenly international trade is going to change. No.